This is a true crime podcast. It contains adult themes and content and may not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. You lost all constitutional rights the moment you walked through that door. When the judge sat down there, I said to shoot 10 years at the Idaho State Penitentiary. You walked in that door, you was a number. And the inmate understood that. If you're out there, there's a pass in here. You can get in here and just lay down and do it. Those inmates that were here in the institution during an execution, it had an impression on them that maybe it was still with them to some extent. Maybe they don't think about it anymore, but it, it had a, an impression on them, I'm sure. They wouldn't let me out until I get back to the <laughs> Seven months later, I get back to them. That was one of, the, one of the problems we ran into. If you had five or six guys that were sitting in a place smoking a joke and a drinking coffee, pretty quick they'd have to plan in there to... to get under your skin some way or, or try to figure a way out. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Behind Gray Walls, a podcast about the old Idaho penitentiary and the men and women who serve time here. Now, you're probably thinking, this isn't normally the voice we hear right after the theme song. That is because we are missing our good friend Anthony today, but we have replaced him just for a couple episodes with someone that you've heard on the podcast several times before and someone who has done incredible research and I know is going to have an awesome episode for us, Samuel Anderson. So Sam, welcome. Thank you for having me, Sky. I'm so happy that you're here. And I think maybe we should start with yours first. We'll get you in and, and uh, get you used to the, the spotlight, as it were. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's a pleasure to be able to step in to big shoes to fill. Don't worry, guess. Uh, <laughs> Anthony's not going to be gone forever. I'm just going to be stepping in just for a minute. But I think we have some pretty fun inmates to talk about today. And, and I guess also I forget that Anthony and I like to sort of banter at the top. So how have you been doing? How's, uh, <laughs> how, remind me how long you've been here at the pen and stuff. So I've been at the pen um, for about a year and a half now. I uh, started in um, 2021. I'm currently the technical records specialist. I um, basically help Anthony. I, I do a lot of research for him and a lot of uh, genealogy and family research for guests who come in. Nice. How is being back in Boise? Oh, it's the best. I mean, home is, doesn't matter how long I've been away or where I've been, home is the best. And now we get to record in studio and I'm not, my, my audio quality isn't terrible. So thrilled about that. And of course you beat the snow. You, you left the mountains before any big I, storms. I did, I did, um, which is good because I'm not a skier. So uh, I would have been stuck there for until all the snow melted, which would have been fine. But, you know, it's it's. I'm, I'm glad I was telling you, obviously, before we started recording that, I left right as the leaves started to blow off the trees in, in Sun Valley. But here, the leaves are still changing. In my backyard, we have a giant oak tree that only a few leaves have changed. So it's kind of fun to get to experience like two different falls. So thrilled about that. Boise is a beautiful fall. And it, and it is different than the mountains. Mm -hmm, like the mm -hmm. colors are different. The time of year it happens. Mm -hmm. I um, fall back home for me, you know, the leaves change at the beginning of October mm. and, and by the end of October, the trees are all barren. Right. Where are you from? Uh, East Idaho. That's right. Okay. So, of course, um, to be in Boise and, and like have like the leaves still kind of in that mm -hmm. beautiful fall at the end of the end of October makes it really nice, especially for mm -hmm. the Halloween season. Totally. Yes. Well, I think that I can't wait to hear about what you've you've got today. So let's uh, let's start with you. Let's see what you got. So the inmate I'm talking about today is uh, Chester Arthur King, and some of the sources I used while researching. The biggest, as you're going to see, is the Wall City Bulletin, which of course was the newspaper used by the inmates during the 1930s. Idaho Statesman. Ancestry.com, newspapers.com, and of course, his inmate file. Now, Chester Arthur King was born on October 23rd, 1916 in Tuttle, Oklahoma, to Nellie Marie Cooper, who is only 16, and his father, Charles Arthur King, who is 25. His father, Charles, was a farmer and a long-term resident of Oklahoma. 
King unfortunately would have a difficult childhood. His mother, Nellie, would pass away on April 16, 1931, at the age of 31. According to the prison records, King's mother died when he was only 12. Mm -hmm. However, based on his mother's death certificate, I think it's probably more likely King was closer to 14. Still, either way, he was quite young. Mm -hmm. Obviously, losing a parent is hard at any age, but it's especially hard when you're just a kid. And it's pretty clear her death had a pretty big impact on young King. The death of his mother would be one of the factors to cause King to drop out of school in the seventh grade. Like so many other low-income kids in the era, King would go to work in order to help provide for his family. Later, the parole board would describe him as having poor childhood opportunities. In 1934, at the age of 17, King would commit his first crime and be jailed in Newcastle, Oklahoma on March 23rd. Four days later, on March 27th, King would be sentenced to a year at the Oklahoma State Reformatory on the charge of assault with a deadly weapon. King must have been pardoned early because on January 30th of 1935, he would be caught again, but this time he would be charged with larceny. And do you know the, the details of any of those crimes? You know, I couldn't find anything about the assault with the deadly weapon. Mm. It took me forever to even find out why he was in that mm. reformatory to begin with. I don't know if it was because he was a minor mm. or because it was perhaps not a very newsworthy event. Sure. But yeah, I, I'm kind of dying to know mm -hmm. what that was. Yeah, that happens sometimes where you just like, I would give anything to know what this is, but I just can't find it anywhere. So, okay, good. And it's a small detail, but I feel like it's important yeah. too. You yeah. know, the, with the theme that always instigates the crimes to come. Right. Anyway, uh, on January 30th, he, of course, is caught stealing. Do you have any guess of what King might have stolen? I mean, it could be anything. Maybe this is in the 30s in, like, Oklahoma area. Maybe, like, some cattle? Under his alias Doyle Ike Smith, King was actually caught stealing groceries. Oh, well, yeah. Unfortunately, that kind of makes sense. Yeah, you know, this is the Great Depression. Right. You know, very impoverished family, uh, especially coming straight out of jail mm -hmm. or, or the reformatory. You can definitely see that kind of influence some of these behaviors. Uh, he, of course, would be given a $20 fine. Unfortunately, this is a pattern we would continue to see. Over the course of the next year and three months, King would be caught and charged for four counts of minor larceny. He would receive fines ranging from $11 to $20. Between the five separate accounts of theft, he would be fined a total of $82 during those 15 months immediately following his first incarceration. But after moving west, King would set his eyes on something a little bigger. And on February 16th, King would steal a car in Bannock County, Idaho. He would commit the crime with the aid of Don Thomas, who was only 19 years old. After stealing the car, the two boys would try to escape across state lines, only to be captured in Ogden, Utah, by the local police. In addition to the stolen car, the boys were discovered to have stolen several hundred dollars worth of firearms. After being apprehended, the boys were transported back to Idaho, where the crime had taken place. King would be held in Bannock County Jail while he awaited his trial. On March 1st, King finished his Saturday bath, but instead of returning to his cell, he decided to just keep walking until he was out of the building. He appeared to be trying to make a clean break. Hey. <laughs> Some pun intended, of course. <laughs> You're already more punny than Anthony. <laughs> I know. Uh, I have to make up for, for his ability somehow. <laughs> After getting out of jail, he would hitchhike 18 miles to the city of Downey. There, he would visit a small cafe and sit down to a hot cup of coffee. However, King's extraordinary luck that he seemed to be having that day finally was running out. Because across the cafe, also enjoying a cup of coffee, was J.E. Marshall, Downey's deputy sheriff. Oh who not only immediately recognized the escapee, but stood up and proceeded to arrest King there on the spot. All in all, King had only managed to escape for about seven hours. King would not get another escape attempt, 
and on the 15th of March, 1937, King would plead and be found guilty of burglary. Don Thomas, his partner in the crime, would be sentenced to 5 to 15 years in the penitentiary for their crime. King, perhaps because he was one year older than Don, or possibly because of his attempted escape, would be sentenced to not less than six and not more than 15 years of incarceration at the Idaho State Penitentiary. According to his Bretillion, King was 20 years old, his height was 69 inches, and his weight was 139 pounds. Build medium, race white, occupation painter, and dairyman. He was single, scar on cheek, scar on right wrist, vaccine scar on left arm, either boil scar or birthmarks on knees, and finally a scar on the back of his neck. Unfortunately, we do not have a lot of information about how King spent his time while incarcerated in the prison. What we do know was during his time, King took at least one class to try and learn the piano. We also know that he was disciplined on February 23rd, 1938, after he caused some sort of disturbance in the cell house. King was locked up in his cell because of it. June 26, 1938, he violated a house rule, but in this instance, the guard gave no further explanation. Mm. Other than these two violations and the piano class, we do not know a lot of what King's time was like here in the prison. We do not know what he was doing for work or what his day-to-day -day routine was like. We know from later reports that King never escaped or made any escape attempts while serving at the Idaho State Penitentiary. The fact that he only had two discipline violations, I think it's safe to assume that while he was not the best behaved inmate, he was far from the worst either. Sure, of course. However, we do have a strong record of one thing he did in prison, and that was his experience boxing. This, of course, is the reason I first became interested in learning more about his life. King had a pretty remarkable career fighting inside the pen. Now, just as a reminder to listeners who missed our episode on boxing, King would go on to compete during the in-house era. This was between 1936 and 1940, in which prisoners held at least 13 boxing events with a minimum of 101 confirmed fighters. These were public fights that were watched by inmates as well as citizens of Boise. Non-inmates would have to pay 85 cents to get in and watch these fights. All of these fights during this era took place in the prison and would be inmate versus inmate. And I think that catches you up. But if you are curious about boxing in the Idaho Penitentiary, go listen to the Boxing Stool Pigeon episode in Season 6 to get a more extensive look into the history of 80 years of fighting at the Idaho State Penitentiary. On February 22nd, King competed in his first boxing match that I can find record of. And this is February 22nd, 38? Correct. Okay. Prison plans fights today. Idaho State Penitentiary will offer 36 rounds of boxing today, beginning at 1 o'clock as part of the observance of George Washington's birthday. It was announced Monday by A.W. Hodge, State Prison Sports Dictator. Director. <laughs> <laughs> I like the idea that he's the sports dictator, though. <laughs> The main event bout on the program will pit Harry McJuckins, 181 pounds, against Gilbert Raff, 190 pounds, in a seven-round exhibition that alone is sure to give the fans a fighting good time, Hodge said. Other bouts on the card are Ernie Draper, 137, meets Leo Clark, 140, in the six-round semifinal. Bill Bevins, 170, tangles with Virgil May, 182, and another six-rounder. Charles King, 138, will trade blows with Cecil Willard, 138. I'm always lost in terms of, like, weight classes. So 138, what sort of weight class would that put him in? That's actually kind of an interesting bit of history. That that puts him in a, basically the welter class. Okay. So a little less than middleweight. Um, back in the day, especially during the 70s and, and prior, um, heavyweight fights were the big thing. Right. Everyone wanted to see Ali, Mike Tyson, Joe Lewis, the, 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 big, the biggest and the baddest. But over time, we've actually seen a transition in which more people are interested in um, kind of the welterweights. Okay. This is kind of the popular weight now, of course. Uh, Floyd Mayweather, mm -hmm. um, 
Conor McGregor in mm -hmm. over in MMA land. Uh, yeah. There are a lot of fighters who are kind of this smaller weight class okay. because now audiences are kind of more interested in those really fast fights as opposed to those big hitters mm, okay. that we see in those heavyweight matches. So, so okay, because I feel like I always that you know I just see the commercials that come on and they're like featherweight and now there's like bantamweight and then there's like middleweight and so like what is welterweight and where does that fit into those so categories welterweight is you know essentially and and i'm don't know the exact weight but it's about 130 to about 145 okay and uh middleweight is about 150 and then like cruiserweight is going to be like 175 flyweight's usually 110 okay and then um heavyweight is usually above 200 <sighs> we've also seen a transition over time too in which um with the years gone by, heavies just got bigger and bigger. Right. Uh, in Ali's day, it was typically about 220. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now with Mike Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder, it's usually like 265. <laughs> Gosh. And to complicate things even further, you have to remember for amateur, it's, it's scaled back. Mm, okay. So, for example... If I ever fought pro, which I never will, but I would be technically a cruiser and pro. Okay. But in an amateur, I'm often considered a heavyweight. Okay. Even though I would be a very light heavyweight for okay. professional gotcha. fighting. Okay. That was just a little sidebar I was curious about because I just see those those thrown out. And my dad and I were actually having this conversation the other day of like, I don't even know what that actually means. So good to know. Different weight classes kind of attract like I said, different types of fighting. Mm. Heavyweights always go for knockouts. For sure. they, they go for those big shots. And as you're going to see with King, these kind of smaller guys exchange a lot. They do a lot of damage. They throw a lot of shots mm. really quick okay. before, before gotcha. the fights end. His first fight, I was sadly unable to find the results of. But on March 19th, the Idaho Statesman published another article called Prison Holds Boxing Today, in which they announced that the KO King, weighing 138 limbs, would fight Buck O'Deal, who is 136 limbs, in a four-round bout. Now, of course, this is where things get a little tricky as a researcher, and that is the beauty and fun of nicknames. K.O. King could refer to another inmate. However, the fact that that is the exact same weight that King fought at last time, that there seems to be other references to him by this title later on, and to add to the equation the fact that the boxing program was not that big in 1938, I feel confident in saying that K.O. King was in fact most likely Chester Arthur King. K.O. King is also an interesting nickname, a KO, for those of you who are unfamiliar with boxing terminology, would mean a knockout. So, if his nickname is KO King, that would definitely suggest that he might have won his February 22nd fight by KO. Or perhaps even a fight we do not have a record of. It might also just be a hopeful nickname. <laughs> I've definitely met a few up-and-coming boxers who've wanted to attribute the title to themselves before they've actually earned it. <laughs> That's not how nicknames work. <laughs> oh, I know. And um, everyone thinks knockouts are so easy. Everyone, every new fighter I talk about talks about how they're going to just knock everybody out. And it doesn't happen that much in fighting. No. It truly doesn't. Even like on professional level, like it's a lot more rare than I think people realize. Mm. On March 20th, we got the results of the fight. Idaho Statesman reports King beat Odell in the fourth round. This win could also have been from a possible knockout. It's suggested, but not definite. May 27th, King would get his biggest fight yet, metaphorically as well as physically. King, who only weighed 135 pounds, would fight Aaron Draper 147 limbs for the prison welterweight title. This was a six-round championship bout. Not only Draper, the prison welterweight champ, but he also outweighed him by 12 pounds. This is what the Idaho statesman would have to say about it. A second six-round bout will feature two scrappy lads in a bout for the prison's welterweight championship. Chet King, 135 pounds, will spot the present title holder. Aaron Draper, about 12 pounds. According to the prison officials, Draper tips the beam at 
147 pounds. Well, I do not know the exact results of this fight. The fact that King does not defend his title on Memorial Day's fight card makes me suspect he lost this fight. Here's an interesting side note. Don Thomas, the inmate incarcerated with King for stealing the car, would also compete in boxing match on May 27th. I do not know the outcome of this fight, nor do I have anything suggesting he ever had another match. It seems that King's friend Thomas did not find the ring as appealing as King did. King's next fight would take place on Memorial Day. It was not uncommon for boxing events at the prison to have comedy bouts, as we've talked about in our last boxing episode. In the early days, the comedy bout was held before the first fight, but later on, into the 70s, this would become a halftime tradition. <laughs> These comedy fights were wild and had a large range of variety. The Memorial Day card is a great example of this. The July Clock, written by Bud, said this about the spectacle. <laughs> The Memorial Day fight card was the best produced here in more than a year. Responsibilities for the improvement is due to the efforts of Dunk, who's really developing some good fighters. A comedy bout between Guy and Morgan opened the card. This was one of those things when each man is supplied with a glove on one hand and a tin pie plate on the other for sound effects. The problem was the hammer away with the tin plates to get in range and then swing wildly. The boys got a draw without a solid blow having been struck. King had the preliminary main event, the fifth fight of the night, which is a pretty big deal. He was fighting as one of the main attractions. Bud reports this on the fight. Six rounds. King, 141 limbs versus Craig, 143 limbs. As everyone expected, this meeting of two clever fighters stole the show. Both used up most of their tricks in the bag and were exceedingly tired boys at the end of the bout. It would have taken a close decision to give the fight to either man and a draw was received with agreement by the crowd. It is in the belief that King fought the best fight of his career here. This fight was a huge crowd pleaser at the prison. Both of the fighters were very well respected and everyone wanted a rematch. On the 4th of July, their fans got their wish. This is what the Wall City Bulletin writes about the event. Fights on the 4th. Fights promised for the 4th came through as scheduled. The attendance was way below normal for such a holiday, probably due to three and a half day celebration. We suppose that all who could possibly do so left town on the least pretext. Fishing trips probably call in most. For some inexplicit reason, our card was not up to par. The jinx was on for a while everyone worked hard in their training and we were expecting some jam-up fights, the results were kind of a letdown. As the public likes the old blood to spurt and knockdown galore, in place of this we saw some clever boxers go through their paces with lots of action but few upsets. Now, skipping ahead to the main event. Main event, six rounds, King 146 limbs versus Craig 147 limbs. Haynes referee. This was a rematch from our Memorial Day card at which time they fought a draw. The boys moved in fast and exchanged lightning lefts with Craig looking a little the better as they go on. Craig landed three sharp lefts to follow with a right to the jaw. They both threw caution to the wind and slugged it out. King went down for the count of three, got up to take a left and a right to the head and went into the ropes, the bell ending the first round. In the second, King didn't appear to have fully recovered. He came out of his corner wide open. They mixed it hot and hard for a few swings when King stopped one and hit the floor when he took a nine count. He used his head and came up in a crouch to stave off Craig's rushes with sharp lefts to the head. The seconds do a swell job of bringing King around in the minutes rest between the rounds. And in the third, he came out with a fairly clear head and proved early in this round that he had a fighting heart. While this pace didn't slacken a bit, the telling effects of King's determined attitude to fight his way out of a hole was noticeable by all. Truly, these boys were wonders to watch, and it would have been anybody's guess of the outcome. The blows were raining in too thick and fast to count. 
The fourth round was a repetition of the first, and the seconds minus the knockdowns. King sensed his slight advantage and proceeded to go to work. His blows came fast and with telling effect. His punching ability had Craig in the muddle, and Craig was bleeding from the nose and mouth most of the round. King was not able to land a true blow with his right, as Craig, though tired, was able to get away in time. In the fifth, it was still either his fight, though King seemed less tired. He started his old 1-2 to take the round by a big margin. Craig had absorbed a lot of punches, and at the end of this round, he was a very tired boy, but still fighting for all he was worth. In the sixth, Craig looked better again, but sensed to have lost his KO punch, landing several but without much damage. King's comeback was a surprise, and the last half of the round they were slugging toe-to-toe, -to -toe, King getting the decision. Hmm. Quite the, uh, the fight. It sounds really exciting. It seemed like he was out that first couple, those first couple rounds, and then he came back, and that's very exciting. And that's like what we love to see in sports, right? That's what sports are about. It's also fun to see sports writing yeah. and back before we, you know, this was definitely not being filmed. Right. And so inmates who want to relive the experience or, or miss the fight night for whatever reason, um, the Bud, the author of this, really put a lot of work into trying to mm -hmm. make the audience visualize what was actually going on in mm -hmm. the fight. Mm -hmm. So once again, this fight will be under the nickname Punchy King. But based on what we know, this is still our guy. King's next fight was on Labor Day, which he would fight against Kid Osborne. This is what Bud would say about that fight. The sixth bout, as far as it went, was one of the best of the day. Scheduled for six rounds, Punchy King versus Kid Osborne, 149 limbs. Started like a miniature war. Osborne came out of the first bell to set the pace, which was fast and furious, never giving King a chance to box as he would have liked to. At the bell, King was groggy from the terrific punishment. The second round started like the first. Osborne boring in and in the center of the ring, it became a given and taking proposition. Both boys giving as well as taking until King finally went down for a seven count from a hard right to the jaw. But he came back gamely, although much weakened to land lefts and rights to Osborne's jaw. Osborne hesitated as though to get set to finish the job soon, then sailed in to stop a well-timed right to the left eye, opening an old wound and making blood spurt all over the ring. But Osborne still won the round. Between rounds, Osborne's eye was patched up the best way possible, but in the third round, the tape was soon knocked off, and the eye was evidently bothering him as it was bleeding profusely, and King was trying to measure him for the famous one-two, working on the eye continuously, but at the end of the round, had failed to slow the kid down. The boxing commissioner stopped the fight because of Osborne's eye, giving the fight to King as a technical KO. Ah, uh, I bet. So it, the way it sounds is the other guy actually probably would have won had it not been for that wound. You know, and, and that's a wonderful question. And, and I don't know. Um, King, as, as we've seen just in the last couple of fights, had a really incredible ability to get hurt and come back mm -hmm. from it. You know, he could have done a similar thing as he did in the last fight in which he took damage and still kind of pulled it back together by the end. Or uh, maybe Osborne would have had him. And that's definitely one thing you learn as fighters. Like once you have your opponent hurt, whether it's a cut, whether it's a broken rib or whatever, you go for that spot. Oof. You 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 don't lay pressure off it because if you can get a KO or in this case a technical KO, it's worth working those injured spots. Boxing is fun, but boxing is brutal. <laughs> yeah, and um, especially cut men back in the 1940s would have been pretty gnarly. The field of cut men has gotten a lot better over the years, but um, still it's kind of gnarly to have like almost a trained medical position just trying to patch you up so you can keep going. That's crazy, man. Now, King's last fight I have record on would take place that Labor Day, which unfortunately had a rocky start to the entire event with a somewhat vague and cryptic description of the comedy fight. 
This is how the article starts. Our Labor Day fight came off in a tip-top shape, every bout proving to be a bang-up leather sling and brawl. So we feel justified in bestowing that all who witnessed the bouts left satisfied. But we do attempt to apologize for the sickly attempt at comedy that opened the show, a purported comedy boxing match that was anything but comical. We were relieved when these participants left the ring. Oof, harsh. Yeah, it makes you wonder what happened, Seriously. Right? But moving on to King's match. The six-round special event between Punchy King weighing 146 limbs and King Osborne weighing 148 was so fast and furious from the bell that everyone was spellbound. King is noted for his ability to do his best when the going is the toughest, but he met his master in this encounter. Osborne came out fast to shoot lefts and rights to Punchy's chin. He took advantage of the, this opportunity and dropped Punchy with a terrific right to the jaw. Punchy wouldn't stay down for the count and came up with a glassy stare in his eyes. He was dropped six times Oof. before the KO came at the end of the first round. A short but sweet fight. Oh, at the end of the first round. So Osborne said, I know what you did last time. Let me make sure that doesn't happen again. Yeah, this this definitely suggests your theory that Osborne would have won the yeah, previous yeah. match. I also have to, once again, imagining the inmates reading the newspaper, I have to wonder what King felt reading, mm, mm -hmm. uh, finally met his master. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, it, it would, have been, would have been super embarrassing to lose at a first-round fight. But let's talk about the fight for a minute. Speaking from personal experience, it takes a lot to get up from a knockdown. You're hurt, bleeding, disoriented. As the ref counts standing above you, you only have 10 seconds to get back to your feet. It's hard to get up physically and emotionally. A lot of fighters will stay down just so the pounding can be over. To get up six times shows an unreal amount of courage. I think this fight perhaps proves more than any other his heart and his ability to keep fighting even when hurt and dazed. Totally. I think I did some sparring like once and I got hit a couple times and I had like a little head thing on and it wasn't like jarring. Like I wasn't hurt, but it just was like, this is really hard. Like this is really brutal. And yeah, I cannot six times is a lot. And and I guess I also thought when you first said it, it was like six times in the whole fight. It was six times in the first round, which is what, like three minutes yeah. So it had to just been like punch, knock down, punch, knock down. And that like that is hard. But that I think you're right that 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 does take a lot of heart to to do that. Well, and that would never really happen in modern fighting. Mm. You know, if you're going down that many times, they'd stop They'll step in and it. stop it. Yeah. The doctor would probably step in and stop it if the ref hasn't. When you go down, you you are often really disoriented and it's like really hard to kind of get your feet back under you and like both being on the receiving and the reciprocating end of that it's it's pretty brutal six times like you mm -hmm. said just over and over again well and they mentioned in that article that he came up with like a glassy look in his eye and that is you know like you said i mean because especially in all sports now there's so much more emphasis on concussion protocol and and that day's look in people's eye, he had to have been concussed several oh. times over. Not just, maybe not just from that fight, but just, I mean, that's just boxing, right? Just yeah. Sort of the risk of the, of the activity. Yeah, so when I was doing the boxing project last year, I did a lot about brain damage and um, specifically death in boxing. Mm. Um, you know, there, there is death in boxing. It's actually less common than you might think, mm -hmm. um, especially compared to, like, football. Um, the brain damage is, it's pretty bad, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily as bad as, as other sports. Right. For example, right. and I'm, I'm not calling you out here, Sky, but um, <laughs> for amateur uh, 
boxing versus college soccer. Mm -hmm. uh, soccer players get worse brain damage than boxers. Well, yeah, I mean they're heading that ball and and uh, heading each other. I was a goalkeeper, so I never oh. I never had to do that. I let everyone else do that, and I got to use my hands. But yeah, I mean absolutely. Um, I remember uh, a couple World Cups ago, uh, Germ there was a Germany was playing, and this German guy got a concussion. And they took him off the field just to make sure he was okay. And he, like, at that time, they didn't have very good concussion protocol. And so they let him back onto the field. I think it was in the first half that it happened. And later, they interviewed him after the game was over. And he was like, I don't remember anything about that first half of the game. And that was, I think, the, the first time that FIFA was like, okay, we really need to do something about this. And and so I think it's great that we're starting to see that. And I totally believe that soccer players get them a lot more. Um, just because boxing has, you know, you've got the padded gloves to try to, you know, protect from that. And um, so, yeah, I that's, that's interesting, though. Though I'd imagine the biggest sport of all would be football. Yeah, and, and you're absolutely right. Soccer definitely is much rougher than I think people realize mm -hmm. and are much harder on your body. Um, nothing beats football as far as brain damage. Yeah. Um, the brain damage in football is very, very intense. And, and it makes a very com interesting compare and contrast mm -hmm. to boxing because often everyone wants to ban boxing but doesn't necessarily want to ban football. Mm -hmm. And like, <laughs> even though football may do worse damage to your body, uh, there's different intention. Mm -hmm. Football, you're not trying to hurt people. You're trying to score points. Hurting people is just kind of a means to an end. Mm -hmm. Where boxing, the goal is to hurt people. And so it's a little harder for people to watch who mm -hmm. may be a little more sensitive to that. Mm -hmm. I think it's been a fun uh, change of pace to talk about sports and, and the heart that comes with it. And that, you know, these inmates still deserved to have that sort of entertainment and deserved to be able to do that sport if they were good at it and talented at it. And, and so I think that that is, um, I love this story. You know, I, I agree with you completely. It's sports were obviously, they matter to everybody. They matter especially to inmates, especially people who've had those things taken away. Now, this is the last fight I've record on. Whether King decided to retire after the violent fight or just was unable to get another match before his time was over, I don't know. It's also possible that there are more fights that we just don't have record of. But if there was, there could have not been many because in his incarceration was coming very close to a close and he was about to be released. On June 17, 1941, King was granted a one-year conditional release, where he was moved back to Ogden, Utah, to spend his year of parole. However, on the following year, on June 15, he was charged for giving a fictitious check. The local authorities also believed he'd been involved in tire stealing and selling. They described mm -hmm. him as not taking his parole seriously. King apparently had faith that his pardon would happen automatically at the end of his parole, no matter his behavior. <laughs> well, That's not how that works. <laughs> despite the complaints sent by his parole officer, King was proven to be correct because he was still granted a final pardon oh. on June 17th, 1942. Dang it, that is how it works, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're probably guessing where this is going because... Unfortunately, King was not able to stay out of trouble. Only five years later, on September 23, 1949, King pled guilty on a charge of burglary in San Quinto, California. Yeah, there is some exchange between officials in California and staff members in the Idaho prison, but this is really where the paper trail ended for me. Over the next 60 years, I was actually able to find more on his family than I was able to find on him. Mostly about different life events of his five brothers and four sisters. From what I could tell, out of King's nine siblings, five of those siblings would come from his father's second marriage. Mm. King would end up outliving all of his siblings. I never found any evidence that King was ever married or had any kids. And on March 9th, 2008, Chester Arthur King would pass away at the ripe old age of 91 years old. Mm. Obviously, I have a lot of questions about the remainder of his life, 
Was he able to escape the cycle of crime? Did he ever box again? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I really don't. King was incarcerated for four years, and during that time, he was able to have a short but impressive career in boxing. King had at least seven fights I could find record of, with three wins, one loss, one draw, and two with unknown decisions. King definitely had some hard things happen to him in his life, the loss of his mother, poverty, and difficult childhood circumstances. His response to this, of course, was to turn to crime. But during his time in prison, he turned to boxing as an outlet. I have to wonder what that was like for him. How difficult it was to learn the sport. How nervous was he the first time he walked up to his first fight. How did it feel when he earned his reputation and respect from the other inmates? What it was like to be brought down to the canvas again and again, but still manage to get back up to your feet. Boxing teaches a lot of things. Discipline, confidence, and determination to name just a few. I think we're left to wonder what sort of impact boxing had on Chester Arthur King's time inside the penitentiary, as well as his life after. But one thing you can bet for sure is that at least for four years, boxing must have meant the world to him. That's so true. And, and it gave him an outlet, um, you know, in prison to, you know, be able to do something besides, you know, work and, and be incarcerated. And, and I do think it's great that the, the, the uh, sports dictator, uh, <laughs> director, um, allowed that to, to happen. And, and there may be some people who say, well, they're in prison and they should be punished for it. But again, you know, just a reminder that these are people you know, the, the sports, I think, was not only good for those who participated in it, but those who were able to watch, you know, those those articles really seemed like everyone was so excited to, you know, be able to watch those and, you know, see their fellow inmates. And so, yeah, I think that that is a really great story. Thank you so much for your research and, and um, telling it to us. Absolutely. It was, it was fun to be able to share a little more boxing. Before we move on to our next inmate, which I'm sure is going to be fantastic, <laughs> uh, we actually have a very exciting announcement for the fans of the show and guests of the site. I'm proud to announce the next year the Old Idaho Penitentiary is partnering with Marine Boxing Academy to hold a brand Shut new up. event. What? Boxing at the Pen. Yes. This will be a fitness class to introduce the basics of boxing. This is a great way to learn about boxing for those with zero experience, and for those who do have experience, this will give them an opportunity to train in a location unlike anything they've done prior. In addition to the awesome training being provided, we will also have some educational presentations on the history of boxing, as well as a collection of boxing artifacts. Anthony and I have been going around looking for artifacts, and it sounds like we're going to have a pretty great display. We will have food vendors, so whether you love boxing, you're casually curious, or you just want to hear some great stories, please come join us on April 8th, 2023 for an awesome experience. A lot more details are to come, so keep an eye out. Oh my gosh, that sounds so fun. I'm actually going to be in Los Angeles for that, and I'm so sad. Uh, I actually uh, trained with Daniel, who owns the Boxing Academy that we're partnering with. He was at uh, the gym that I was learning how to do boxing at, and he's a great coach, and I know that he's brought Ryan over with him, and Ryan is an excellent coach. Are you a coach there? No. Were you I, just trained there? I've I've trained with Daniel and Ryan. They've they've cornered me for several fights. Um, They're both such yeah. great guys yeah, just totally. just they have so much heart so much compassion they really care about their fighters they make kind of a dynamic duo mm -hmm. as as i'm sure you remember yeah. they they will definitely put together a fun class oh, i want to go so, so bad that's so fun i've also been trying to get us to do sports in the pen forever i've been trying to get us to do like a 3 on 3 basketball tournament on the mm -hmm. basketball court so maybe this will be a, a way to get you know sports incorporated with the site because they did happen here so that's so awesome uh definitely recommend anyone who's interested in signing up boxing is such a good workout even if you never fight um and it's it's fun to like learn all those movements and and uh you really start to feel really strong and that maybe even if you don't 
fight, you know, within the boxing, you at least maybe could defend yourself on the street if you needed or whatever. But that's so fun. I'm so jealous. I wish I could be there. We'll, we'll take lots of pictures. For yes. You. Don't worry. Don't yes. Worry. Well, thank you so much. That was great. And they'd blow the whistle for breakfast. The cooks would have breakfast ready, you see, and they'd walk in there and serve them their breakfast. They'd go sit down and eat their breakfast, and, uh, and then they, they'd go back out in the rec hall, and, and some of them would play cards. And, and uh, we had a boxing ring out there, and uh, oh, really? some of them would uh, box a little bit and, uh, and uh, uh, walk and exercise. And, and they'd play ball out here in the yard. And they have their own things that they'd done during the day. And all. We just had to keep our eye on them as so. well. Well, I'm, I'm excited to hear what you have for us today, Scott. Well, unfortunately, there is no boxing in my story today. It's a lot about the Dust Bowl, which is not nearly as exciting. But today, I am talking about number 5304, Mary Turner Hansen. So sources for this story are The Inmate File, Newspapers.com, um, especially The Idaho Evening Times and The Idaho Statesman, Ancestry.com records, which I actually didn't think I would be able to list as a source because finding her was nearly impossible. But in my in my outline, it says in all caps, I found her with three exclamation <laughs> points. So I think I was very excited when I finally found her. Congratulations. Thank you. A web page on the Dust Bowl from the National Drought Mitigation Center from the University of Nebraska. And that website, if you're interested, is drought.unl.edu slash Dust Bowl. It is actually a really cool uh, resource. Digital history project called Homesteading the Plains Toward a New History, which is, it's a digi- like I said, digital history project companion to a book of the same name by Richard Edwards, Jacob K. Freifeld, and Rebecca S. Wingo. The archives.gov article on the Homestead Act. An article called April 14th, 1935, Black Sunday Dust Storm by Jenny Ashcraft on the Fish Wrap, which is the official blog of newspapers.com. I don't know why it's called Fish Wrap, but okay. And then an article called The Lesser Known History of African American Cowboys by Katie Nojim Badham um, from the Smithsonian Magazine in 2017, uh, a history.com article on the Dust Bowl, and then uh, just two Wikipedia articles, The Chickasaw Nation and the Agricultural Adjustment Act. So... Mary Turner Hansom was born Mary Turner near Cass, Texas on November 27th, but the year she was born is a little unclear because different records list different years. So it's most likely 1893, but it could be anywhere between 1890 and 1901. Her parents were Alexander Turner and Ona Allen Turner. Now, I want to pause here for a second and note that Mary is African American. Her father was born in Georgia while slavery was still legal. So, following through on his ancestry records, it seems that he actually was born enslaved, which is, I think, is a reminder that slavery was is a lot closer to us than we think. So, uh, it seems wild, but that she, you know, her father was born uh, enslaved. She noted on her intake form that she was born on a plantation in Texas. Of course, if she was born in the 1890s or even in the 1900s, it would not have been a plantation with enslaved labor, but it is probably a place where both of her parents worked as uh, domestic servants. Mary was the oldest of six kids. She had younger brothers Robert, Floyd, and David, and younger sisters Ruth and Katie. Between the 1900 and 1910 censuses, the family moved to Chickasha, Oklahoma, which is part of land under the jurisdiction of the Chickasaw Nation. So I I promise I'm not saying that wrong. But even at 17 years old, according to the 1910 census, Mary was already working as a cook for a private family somewhere nearby. The 1910 also lists Mary as living with her uncle Jerry and aunt Annie in Chickasha. This may have been who she was working for, but the census says she was a wage earner outside of the home. So it probably, she probably wasn't working for her family. I'm also not sure why she would be living with her aunt and uncle instead of her parents, but it could just be she needed a job and that was where she got a job. Then on September 11th, 1911, she married a man named Jimmy Handsome. Jimmy, maybe James or Jamie, was a general laborer about three or four years, Mary Sr., and this was really the only thing I could find about them Mm. or their marriage. But the couple did reside in Chickasha near her family for nearly 24 years, according to U.S. City directories. I couldn't find any evidence of any children that the couple may have had, and she never claimed any on her intake. And like I said, we really have very little details about her during the marriage. 
We do have one U.S. city directory that places her in Chickasha in 1935, but by all accounts, probably around this year, she moved with her mother and one brother, David, to Twin Falls, Idaho, to escape Oklahoma and Texas at the height of the Dust Bowl. Yeah. Here's a little bit of Dust Bowl history. So much of the information for the section, unless otherwise stated, comes from a great website called the National Drought Mitigation Center at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. And again, it's a really well put together site. Highly recommend checking it out. So the Dust Bowl, quote, technically refers to the western third of Kansas, southeastern Colorado, the Oklahoma Panhandle, the northern two thirds of the Texas Panhandle and northeastern New Mexico, end quote. But the Dust Bowl really affected the whole country in similar ways that I think we can understand over the last few years in terms of what we call, you know, supply chain issues and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. So the Dust Bowl often gets conflated into like one big event over the 1930s, but It was really four separate drought events that happened in such quick succession that the regions never were really able to economically recover before the next one began. And the causes of the Dust Bowl can be traced back to the 1920s. So the Great Plains, this area that the Dust Bowl really happened, had always been a difficult place to try to farm. There were some inaccurate accounts of the region's agricultural potential. So people came in and said, oh my gosh, this is such a great place to farm just because, you know, they wanted to make money on selling land and stuff like that. So that, uh, you know, inaccurate accounts of the potential combined with new farmers inexperience of the very different conditions of the region. So they often came from the more humid parts of the country. And as we know, the Great Plains is not humid, a very different set of soil conditions. And so all of these combined meant that uh, proper land management practices had rarely, if ever, been implemented in this Great Plains region. It was a common thought in the 19th century that the climate would change and become more hospitable as humans settled in the region. And so the government passed several pieces of legislation in the hopes of enticing more settlers. But then as we learn, no one knows how to to farm here. Um, It's not really great for farming. And so it just causes more and more problems. The Timber Culture Act of 1873, quote, was based on the belief that if settlers planted trees, they would be encouraging rainfall, end quote. Then we also know about the Homestead Act of 1862, which gave people 160 acres for free if they lived on it and improved it for five years. According to data used by an economist, Richard Edwards, and by historians Jacob K. Freifeld and Rebecca S. Wingo for their book Homesteading the Plains, Toward a New History, between 1868 and 1901, over 157,000 acres were filed under the Homestead Act in the states of Kansas, Colorado, Oklahoma, and New Mexico. And to give you an idea, 157,000 acres basically equates to nearly 76 million football fields. Wow. So it's a lot, a lot, a lot of land. And so... Theoretically, if this 19th century theory held up, then the climate conditions would have improved drastically with such vast settlement. But the 1920s also brought with them an increased vulnerability to drought in the region. Farmers faced low crop prices and high machinery costs, forcing them to try to develop more land. But the larger problem was that the best farmland had already been developed, so they started to develop quote-unquote submarginal lands, which then led to soil erosion, among other negative effects. So you can see all of these things are just compiling. Recipe for disaster. Absolutely. So economic difficulties also forced farmers to try to cut costs by abandoning practices of soil conservation and switching to the quote more efficient one-way disc plow, which also greatly increased the risk of blowing soil, end quote. I'm not a farmer. I don't know what a disc plow is, but apparently that's not great. So again, All of these things add up to make farming land in the Midwest incredibly vulnerable to, quote, wind erosion, soil moisture depletion, depleted soil nutrients, and drought, end quote, through the 1920s and 1930s. And then, of course, came the Great Depression starting in October 1929. So the first drought event that historians considered the beginning of the Dust Bowl began in 1930, and then there was was a rapid succession of droughts in 1934, 1936, and between 1939 and 1940. Wow. So 1931 saw the first dust storms caused by overplowed farmlands that lacked, quote, deep-rooted prairie grasses to hold the soil in place, end quote. And the dust storms were sometimes so horrific that they were called black blizzards. Wow. Darkening the sky for a few hours, sometimes days at a time. During these black blizzards, dust piled up around houses like snow and seeped through cracks of, quote, even well-sealed homes, leaving a coating on food, skin, and furniture, end quote. Massive dust storms and black blizzards kicked up so many dust particles in the air that these storms could move and black out areas as far east as the Atlantic Ocean. 
So black blizzards first began to make headlines throughout the country in April 1934, with projections that the year's grain yield would be affected or, as we might say today, cause supply chain issues. So any search of the term black blizzard in 1934 and 1935 turn up literally hundreds of newspaper articles every single day from Vermont to California. So this is truly a nationwide concern. May 7th, 1934, from the Leader Post from Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada, reported that, quote, a number of cars have become stuck on what appears to be smooth roads, but in reality were drifts of sand from 18 to 24 inches deep, end quote. And that is an even in the heart of the Dust Bowl. From May 11th, 1934, a dust storm two miles high blew to the East Coast, briefly blotting out both the Statue of Liberty and the U.S. Capitol building. That is so hard to comprehend. Yeah, truly. So hard. Like, yeah, it it's something that thankfully we have never seen since. But I cannot imagine how scary this was. Oh, like to have like the sun blacked out. Blacked out. In the and, middle of the day. Yeah, and not be able to see like the Statue of Liberty, which is on an island, like oh, in the ocean. It's blacked out that far. So then, April 14th, 1935, it was one of the biggest dust storms in the entire Dust Bowl era, and it came to be known as Black Sunday. This storm began in the Oklahoma Panhandle when temperatures dropped nearly 40 degrees and a wall of dust appeared in only a matter of hours. So forgive me for this really long quote, um, but this is, I think, really interesting. So United Press staff correspondent Frank McNaughton reported on his experience, quote, I drove to Clayton, New Mexico from Felt, Oklahoma, through a region once called the Breadbasket of America. The storm broke suddenly about 5 p.m. yesterday. Leaving Felt, I heard cries of dust storm, dust storm. I saw men and women and children running toward their homes. Brave with inexperience, I drove on. Soon the fearsome force was upon me. Across the horizon, the earth rose into the sky. At the top of the dense black wall was a weird yellow fringe. I raced the storm for 55 miles, seeing the ground like the troubled surface of a volcanic pool rising into the air. It caught me at the M.H. Dokerson Ranch. I wheeled into the ranch yard and stopped six feet from the stout, tightly built stock barn. Before I could dash through the doors, the dust hit. I spat on my handkerchief and held it to my nose. I could not see my hand at my face. The dust was inescapable. It sifted through the double walls of the barn and made the air almost unbreathable. It was like emery dust. My lungs still ache. The remainder of the trip to Clayton was frightful. While in the barn, two feet of dust had drifted against the car. Driving was by instinct. Once I ran into a ditch that had been filled with dust. Another time, I ran over a farmer's mailbox, which became visible only when it was a foot beyond the radiator cap. I saw mile after mile of dust drifted like snow against the fences and acre after acre stripped of vegetation and topsoil and in places drifted high with dust, end quote. Per the Fish Rap blog from newspapers.com, a 14-year-old Kansas boy, Lucian Dahl, said after surviving the devastation wrought by the storm, quote, I thought the world was coming to an end, end quote. That is so crazy. Yeah. Sorry, I have more because I, I think I really went down a rabbit hole and was, again, this is something we cannot imagine because I think because we've we've tried to do things to mitigate something like this happening, but just the devastation that came with this. Hundreds of Americans became sick and developed pneumonia from the dust they inhaled during Black Sunday and many of them died. After Black Sunday, Robert Geiger published an article titled Life in Dust Bowl of United States Being Ruled Today by Three Words, If It Rains, end quote. Huh. And this was the first time that the term Dust Bowl actually appeared in the American lexicon. And so Geiger is credited with the invention of this phrase after Black Sunday. Huh. Um, as I said, on April 27th, 1935, Congress passed the Soil Conservation Act in response to this event. And this law was passed, quote, to provide for the protection of land resources against soil erosion and for other purposes, end quote. Now, one of the goals of this program was to plant trees across the Great Plains to act as windbreakers. But Frank McNaughton reported, quote, few ranchers have any faith in federal soil erosion projects. What can man with tractors and listers do to control a destructive phenomenon that ravages thousands of square miles, end quote. And unfortunately, 1935 and Black Sunday was just the height of the Dust Bowl. It continued for years. So from February 27, 1937, the Bluefield Daily Telegraph from Bluefield, West Virginia, gave a detailed description of these black blizzards three years after black blizzards were first reported. So this is going on for years, half a decade at least. 
So, quote, the words that make the above caption of Black Blizzards have not the deep significance to our readers in this favored locality that they do to the people in the Midwest. Recently, in the Oklahoma panhandle, black blizzards raged for four days, closing schools, stranding buses and other highway traffic, and creating distress for residents, many of whom donned dust masks for protection. This is a visitation of the terrific dust storms that have swept the Middle West and Southwest for years as a result of intensive cultivation, dry weather, and freakish high winds. Guymon is a town of more than 2,000 population in Texas County, Oklahoma, one of the three counties that make up the Panhandle. The other two counties are Cimarron and Beaver. These counties border Texas on the north. It is here that the black blizzards have struck with greatest fury. In one small town, according to Guymon reports, 11 deaths resulted from influenza and pneumonia cases that have been (sighs) aggravated by the dust. Traumatic pneumonia has been the cause of death when persons in excellent health suffered congestion of the lungs because of breathing foreign particles. This form of pneumonia does not result from a disease germ. Men have died because their lungs were congested with sand. Mm. In a railroad accident, a passenger fell into a pool of muddy water. He died a few hours later, not from drowning, but because he had breathed dirt into his lungs. Mm. Oklahoma physicians fear there will be cases of what they call dust pneumonia. One physician of Guymon explained that one of the worst effects of the black blizzards was suffered by persons who breathed the dust, thus aggravating sinus and throat trouble. The winds have been sweeping over western Oklahoma from both Texas and Colorado. The black blizzards turned day into night in many communities in Oklahoma, Texas, and Kansas. The tearing gales ripped winter wheat out of the ground, blowing the dry soil for miles in heavy black clouds, hence the descriptive black blizzards. It is not new, but it does not make it less agonizing and destructive. Dust storms of intensity have swept over the southwest and middle west for years. They are expected to get worse instead of better, for as the protective covering of grass over former rangelands is broken and the soil is exposed, the drying out process is accelerated. After that, strong winds do the rest in the creation of black blizzards. The cure for the dust storms might be simple enough if landowners were willing to adopt it. Natural rangeland should not be cultivated in some areas. Nature, if given a chance, will make the adjustments needed, end quote. When thinking about storms, it's, it's, you always imagine yourself going inside and being safe. Mm -hmm. But in this case, you know, the dust is going through the cracks. Mm -hmm. Like you, there's nowhere you could escape. No matter where you are, you're breathing yeah. You're breathing it in. Breathing it in, and it could kill you, which I oh. think is something, like, I don't know if I could think, I mean, I'm sure there is, and, and we are very fortunate to live, I think, in a place that has very few natural disasters, but to think about the weather having such a direct effect on your health, Yeah, which is so interesting. So farmers were incredibly hard-pressed to find solutions, and the federal government had to step in to make the biggest and most long-lasting changes. The New Deal, a federal program of relief, began in 1933 and included some programs aimed at helping rural farmers. And the most important of these was the Agriculture Adjustment Act, and this was designed to boost agricultural prices by reducing a surplus of crops. So basically, the government paid farmers subsidies to slaughter animals and leave uh, and either plant less or just leave fields empty completely. So the New Deal was the first time that the federal government was so active in attempting to alleviate private problems, so it made it possible for the government to pass drought-specific relief programs that even the most individualistic farmers were willing to accept. Per the NDMC website, a variety of federal drought relief programs had the following goals, and this is quoted directly from the site because they say it far better than I could. So the goals were, quote, providing emergency supplies, cash and livestock feed and transport to maintain basic functionings of livelihood and farms and ranches, establishing health care facilities and supplies to meet emergency medical needs, establishing government-based markets for farm goods, higher tariffs and loan funds for farm market maintenance and business rehabilitation, providing the supplies, technology, and technical advice necessary to research, implement, and promote appropriate land management strategies, and finally, removing trees and planting new trees to alleviate psychological stress and create shelter belts, end quote. So these were all the things that the federal government, through the New Deal, were trying to do to prevent this from happening again. But as the NDMC states so eloquently, quote, as important as these these programs may have been, the survival of a majority of the families and enterprises undoubtedly rested solely with their perseverance and integrity, end quote. Finally, by 1941, the Plains were receiving near normal rainfalls and World War II helped alleviate many domestic economic problems that the New Deal could not. And the Dust Bowl was finally over. 
So through all of this, understandably, roughly 2.5 million people migrated from the Dust Bowl region in the 1930s, and this is one of the largest migrations in American history. These refugees were often called Okies, as about 440,000 people left Oklahoma alone, though, of course, not all of them were from Oklahoma. But we do know three of these Okies were Mary, Ona, and David Turner. And over half of these Oklahoma migrants settled in the San Joaquin Valley of California. So keep this in mind for Mary's story. We'll, we'll go back to Mary. So Mary, Ona, and David were living in Twin Falls, Idaho in late 1935, early 1936. Mary had become close with a young man, Charles W. Harris, who was a porter on the trains. The Idaho Evening Times reported first in April 1936 that they were just boarders at the same boarding house. But in May 1936, the Idaho Evening Times reported that Mary was, quote, living as the wife of Harris, end quote. But regardless of whether they were married or living uh, just in the same boarding house, it seems clear that Charles and Mary were a bit more than friends. Charles was also African-American, born in Reno in April 1901, and the Idaho Evening Times reported that he was, quote, said to have been a nephew of Henry Harris, early settler of the Southern Idaho section, end quote. I think the Henry Harris referred to by the Idaho Evening Times was an African-American foreman at the Sparks Herald Company, which was a company of cattle ranches. This was also, interestingly, the company that Diamond Field Jack Davis worked for huh. when he earned his nickname Diamond Field. And, oh, crazy. Um, if you want to hear more about his story, Anthony did cover him in episode 23. So if this Henry Harris is the same one, he was a black cowboy and he was carrying on the legacy of a host of black cowboys from Texas. Many formerly enslaved men who gained experience in working with cattle and horses who were able to get job as cowhands when slavery was no longer legal. As the West continued to expand, black cowboys were central to the building up of the physical space of the West, as well as the creation of the mythic Wild West in American imagination. And I really, really, really recommend checking out an article in the Smithsonian Magazine from 2017 titled The Lesser Known History of African American Cowboys by Katie Nojim Bottom, if you really want to know more about black cowboys like Henry Harris. And I, I highly recommend because there has been a lot of historical scholarship that has come out that says, so, you know, so often we think of cowboys as often these white cowboys, which of course there were, but that this uh, central idea of this cowboy myth does come from these black cowboys. Absolutely. Doing a lot of that research about the Old West this mm -hmm. year, so there's so many stories that aren't looked at, and, and the black narrative mm -hmm. in the Old West is one of them. Mm -hmm. I've seen reports with as high as one-fourth of the settlers and cowboys and miners were, were mm -hmm. black. Yeah. And like that's a huge part of settlement that doesn't get talked mm -hmm. about. The, like you said, the iconic Wild West, the, the black cowboy was a big part of it. Mm -hmm. And so much of that started in Texas, which is having lived in Texas, I learned that they do take on this identity as a, as a Western part of the country, which I'm always like, there's a whole half country that's further west than you, but okay. So anyway, Mary and Charles were close, or at least Mary believed they were close. Charles might have felt differently. We don't really know, but we'll see why there may be a discrepancy there. So it seems that Mary, who worked either as a quote unquote domestic, which usually meant a housekeeper or a cook or perhaps both, uh, she worked for a man named William M. Tomlinson, who I think was living about an hour away from Twin Falls in Richfield. So she may have had to commute. It's a little bit unclear as to why, but it does seem that for some reason, Mary was giving Charles money um, as she worked. Charles, however, was taking that money and pocketing it for another woman whose name was Elizabeth Wolfe from Tulsa, Oklahoma, quote, whom Harris said he would marry, end quote. There are also some reports that Charles was physically abusive to Mary during their relationship. Mm. The Idaho Evening Times on May 14th, 1936, reported that in the past, Mary had been, quote, thrown down an office stairs by Harris, suffering injuries which sent her to the hospital and on another occasion was choked by him, end quote. Jeez. On the evening of April 21st, 1936, Charles and Mary got into an argument, mostly over the fact that Charles had used Mary's money to buy Elizabeth Wolf a train ticket to Boise hmm. from Tulsa. So basically he was paying to get her uh, to him in Twin Falls. Mary had thought that she and Charles were going to get married, and Charles clearly thought he and Elizabeth were going to get married. But according to Mary's account, during the argument, Charles, quote, struck her and displayed a long open knife, end quote, and she grabbed a gun. For some reason that is unclear, they made their way, quote, to a family garage on 2nd Avenue East, end quote, where the argument continued. 
it may be that the garage was attached to their lodgings because their their house was on 2nd Avenue East, but there isn't an exact address given for either the garage or their lodging house. So I don't know how they ended up there. At some point, as Charles was walking the way, the gun discharged and Charles was shot in the back. Charles died on his way to the hospital as the bullet had entered his back and lodged in his lungs. Two other bullets, according to the Idaho Evening Times, hit his right hand and forearm. As soon as she saw Charles on the ground, Mary realized what she had done and immediately gave herself up at the sheriff's office and turned over the gun. The sheriff asked if she had shot someone and she replied, no, I didn't, though she was nervous and weepy throughout and understandably quite nervous. The sheriff then asked if someone was dead and she said, no, I don't think so. She was immediately charged with first degree murder and held without bond. She pleaded not guilty, and her preliminary trial was held on April 27, 1936. The only witness at Mary's preliminary trial was Mrs. James E. DeVault, in whose yard the shooting occurred, who stated that, quote, Mary Hansom opened fire at Harris at a distance of about eight feet, end quote. And no witnesses came to Mary's defense in this preliminary trial. So her real trial was scheduled for May 11th, and that is the same day that jury selection began. A veneer, or jury pool, of 50 people were called, but the next day they actually ran out, ran out of potential jurors because I think this had caused quite a stir around Twin Falls. And so Judge A.B. Barkley had to issue a call for a special veneer of 20 additional potential jurymen. Interestingly, by the time the jury was picked, every single member of the jury was a man, even though women had been allowed to serve on juries in Idaho since 1896 and in the country since the 1920s. In fact, only men had been summoned in the veneer entirely, according to the Idaho Evening Times on May 11th, 1936, which is interesting. But but it, it is such a shame. It doesn't allow, I think, for the women's point of view that says, like, he wasn't treating her very well. And so I can understand, yeah. you know, why she was doing that. That doesn't excuse what she did. But, you know, there maybe is a bit more understanding from a woman's point of view. Having a jury of your peers. Right, exactly. I, again, I don't want to say this for sure, but I would imagine a majority of these jurymen were white. And or, it's going to change what they're going to think and what right. they're going to say, especially in the 30s. The 30s, yeah. 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 And Twin Falls, you know, it's close to Pocatello, which again, as we've talked about several times, was generally um, the main area of the state that had a, a large African-American population. Um, so I, I imagine this was a, a tough spot for her to be in. So her trial began on May 13th, 1936. The prosecution's argument revolves around the fact that Mary, who the state claimed was, quote, an undivorced woman, end quote, which I don't have any evidence to say either way. She had purposely murdered Charles after finding out that Charles was using her money to bring Elizabeth Wolfe to Idaho to marry her. The state called several witnesses, including a man named Ellisworth Garish, who allegedly sold Mary cartridges for the gun, and Sidney Craig, who supposedly witnessed the purchase. Even though the defense admitted that Mary did carry the gun, they claimed that it was for self-defense after Charles had physically abused her several times. Mary's defense lawyer, W.L. Dunn, said that the defense tactic would be to prove that Mary did indeed have the gun, but she only had it because Charles had first pulled, quote, an open knife, end quote. They claimed that the gun discharged accidentally after Mary and Charles got in a scuffle over it, which I can definitely see the the argument of, but there is, of course, the evidence that he was shot three times. A gun yeah. doesn't discharge accidentally three times. The defense called five witnesses that all testified that the shooting was accidental, including Mary's employer, William M. Tomlinson. They called Dr. C.A. Eames, quote, who testified as to having treated the defendant for injuries caused allegedly by Harris, end quote. So again, they're really leaning into that this was self-defense after he had abused her quite a bit. According to the Idaho Evening Times on May 15th, 1936, a surprise witness, Herman Yarborough, was, quote, recalled by the state in an asserted effort to impeach the defendant's testimony regarding an alleged conversation in which Yarborough is said to have warned Mary Hansom that her efforts to hold the affection of Harris would be unsuccessful, end quote. Mary denied ever having this conversation. Finally, the defense rested on May 15th, and the jury was released to deliberate at 10 p.m. The Idaho Evening Times said, said they deliberated for two hours before going to bed, then resumed deliberation in the morning. And at 11 a.m., they returned a verdict of guilty of voluntary manslaughter. As May 16th was a Saturday, her sentencing was scheduled for the following Monday. 
And on the 18th, she was sentenced to one to 10 years at the Idaho State Penitentiary. And she entered the state penitentiary that same day on March 18th, 1936. So um, her intake form, age 37, height 71 inches, which is quite tall for a woman, 145 pounds, build large, hair black, eyes maroon, complexion dark, no mustache, born Texas Plantation, 1127. This says 1899, occupation cook. And interestingly, there are no marks whatsoever on her Bertillion. There is a Bertillion, but there's just like nothing on it, which is huh. weird. Yeah, that seems low uncommon. Yeah, very, very uncommon. So it's kind of to me like, well, then why have it in there at all? But, yeah. you know, that's what's in there. So I guess maybe she didn't have any scars. Though it should be noted that it does look like in her um, mugshot that she has one of her eyes is swollen shut. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so there is, that isn't, inter- I mean, of course that wouldn't be noted on her battalion because it's not permanent. But that could be, you know, perhaps uh, an indication she was being uh, abused in, or at least, you know, getting into physical altercations in some way. Because I would imagine if her eye was sort of naturally droopy like that, they would have noted that. But Yeah, the photo definitely looks like she's been hurt. Mm-hmm. You know, it, mm-hmm. it doesn't look like a natural thing. It looks like someone who's... yeah been hit in the face a few times so that isn't noted anywhere um that's something that you'll only see with the mugshot which again will be available on our uh, facebook and and instagram so if you're interested in seeing that definitely um run over there so mary was one of nine inmates when she entered including long-term inmates lida southard and mary crumroy though at the time mary crumroy was living in state hospital south and then also uh, she was also in with another former podcast subject angela hopper who we covered in episode 54 Mary came in on the same day as two other inmates from Jerome County, Ellen Vance and Athalia Bybee. So with the addition of Mary, Ellen, and Athalia, concerns over the women's ward population spilled over from the administration into the newspaper. So the Idaho Daily Statesman reported on May 19th, quote, The warden said Monday afternoon that nine women are the most the prison has ever had in its 70 years, and that with Monday's new arrivals, the prison administration is faced with a perplexing problem. There are only seven cells to house the nine women, end quote. And we know that the women's ward would get much fuller in the 50s and 60s, but to this point, it was a high number of inmates. And so now they're not sure, you know, now we have to keep multiple people in in a cell and what does that look like? So it should be noted that we do have a direct account of this crime for Mary herself, which I think was written after she was incarcerated. And there's no date or reason given for why she wrote this account. It could be um, she wrote it to explain herself to the parole board. Could be she was asked after she was brought in. So here is what she said, quote, The act that caused my imprisonment was in an effort defending my life from a brutal attack. Marks of this attack are now on my body, and my mental strain has been most harassing. This man took my money, sending it to a girl in Oklahoma, and brought her to Idaho for the purpose of marriage. During the time he was writing to her, he and I were engaged to be married. I asked him to return my money. He absolutely refused to do this and was most abusive in words and physical strength. I can most candidly say that it never did enter into my mind to take his life nor that of any human, a crime I despise. The act was entirely accidental and such accident I am heartily sorry about. Never have I been in any trouble as any investigation can show. I have always led a busy, quiet, and sober life. I've been brought up in a religious atmosphere by respected, intelligent parents and taught ever to be a law-abiding citizen. Our family is large, and of that number, I am the only one who has gotten into any legal entanglement like this or any nature. My mother is aged and has failing eyesight. I am the only single one in the family, and for that reason, have been mother's support as the other children have their families to care for. When released, you will never have occasion to regret favorable action on my case, as I shall be most careful and live above reproach." End quote. So this is actually the only account other than the monk shot that we have of her saying, I was attacked and this is why I did what I did. Well, and there's a lot of factors going into that. Mm-hmm. You know, the fact that he's essentially cheating on her, mm-hmm. the fact that he's using her money in yeah. order to get this uh, other woman there and then the physical violence. Right. Yeah. And again, you know, it doesn't excuse what she did, but it helps us maybe understand that if it wasn't an accidental discharge, that in her mind, there were justifications for it. There were attacks on a lot of fronts here, financially, Mm -hmm. emotionally. It would be tough. Yeah. So within six months of her incarceration, there must have been some talk that Mary had applied for a pardon. But I couldn't find any official application. This, Like I said, this letter that I just read may have been part of that application, but there's no date on the letter, so I'm not sure when she wrote that. 
But on September 4th, 1936, the Board of Pardons received a letter that read, quote, I understand that a Mrs. Mary Hansen, which is spelled incorrectly, colored, formerly of Twin Falls, Idaho, now in the penitentiary, is making application for pardon. Some friends of mine in Twin Falls and at Hagerman called my attention to this case some time ago. I hesitated to do anything then, but upon further urging, I made such an investigation as I could of the facts and the record. I feel entirely justified in urging upon the board favorable consideration of this application. Without going into detail, it seems to me that, assuming she was properly convicted, justice has been administered fully and that she is entitled to the favorable consideration of the board of pardons, end quote. And this was signed by Senator William Bora on letterhead from the United States Senate huh. Committee on Foreign Relations. And that's that's what he was on that committee of foreign relations at the time. But that's a big deal. Like William Bora still to this day is like a huge name. Um, yeah. And so he he had friends who wrote him and said, you should look into this. This needs to, you know, something needs to be done about this. And he said, I had someone look into this and it seems like she should be released. Talk around Twin Falls about her application must have been steady because on September 22nd, the warden received a petition for pardon from residents of Twin Falls County, which read, quote, we the persons whose names are subscribed here to being residents of Twin Falls County, Idaho, and personally acquainted with Mrs. Mary Hansom, now an inmate of the Idaho State Penitentiary and who has applied to the Board of Pardons of said state for a pardon, do hereby petition said Board of Pardons to grant to said Mary Handsome a pardon, it being our belief that the ends of justice have been served by her imprisonment and that upon her release she will be and remain a good and useful citizen, end quote. And this is signed by 57 people, including 11 of the 12 jurors on her case. Wow. So again, this, I just, there's so much proof that people seem to really be on her side, that she isn't a bad person. Yeah. She didn't set out to kill this man and that justice has been served. So in early October 1936, Franklin Gerard, the Secretary of State, received a letter from a woman named Angela Curran asking the board to consider Mary's case, even mentioning William Bohr's letter in hers. And I don't know Angela's relation to Mary. I think Mary might have worked for Angela's family on the Curran family farm, but their relationship um, was never fully made clear. So again, people are just continually writing. Um, she was not paroled in September or October. After the holidays, on January 25th, 1937, Mary wrote a small note to the Board of Pardons for the April meeting, quote, I shall certainly deeply appreciate your favorable action on my release. My minimum time will have been served on April 18th, 1937. My family and self left the dust-stricken area to make our home in Idaho, and my aged and not well mother has not been in the state long enough to benefit by the old aid pensions. I, having no dependents, and the logical one of my family to assist her. At present, three good positions are open to me. In pardoning me, you can be assured you will have no regret as to my future conduct, as I am determined to ever lead the life of an upright citizen, and you will help me to ask God for a pardon, please, end quote. Then on April 6, 1937, that, again, potential friend slash employer Angela Curran wrote Governor Barzilla J. Clark asking him to take Mary's case into consideration, saying, quote, We tried to get her out once before, but it was too soon. If you will please give her case your consideration, it will be greatly appreciated by the Curran family. If you will please parole her, we will give her a job in our house. We need her badly. I am sending this note in by Mary's brother, and I'm sure if you will look into the case, you will let her out. It would be a great pleasure for all of us if you would stop at the ranch when you go through, as we would like so much to have you. Mother wants me to tell you we would be so appreciative if you would do this favor for us, end quote. So I'm not sure if Angela's letter had any sway whatsoever, if it, or if this letter was simply fortuitously timed. But two days later, on April 8th, 1937, Mary was granted a conditional pardon, the conditions being that she report to the county sheriff between the 1st and 5th of every month for a year. And she left the Idaho State Penitentiary after serving 10 months and 20 days of a 1 to 10 year sentence. She was given a full pardon on April 8th, 1938. Interestingly, the next we find of Mary is a mention of her in the Ogden Standard Examiner on August 25th, 1941, when she was sentenced to pay a $5 fine or spend two and a half days in jail after passing a stop sign in Salt Lake City. I don't know why she was in Salt Lake or what option she chose there, but from Utah, she moved next to Stockton, California, where on June 21st, 1942, she was arrested for disturbing the peace under the name Mary Maggie Handsome. She was sentenced to 90 days in jail, but given a two-year suspended sentence. Ten months later, on April 26, 1943, she was again arrested in Stockton for a drunk hold and sentenced to 150 days in jail, but again given a two-year suspended sentence. 
At this arrest, her name was given as Mary Griffin. So I think she might have actually gotten married at this point because she does go by Mary Griffin for the rest of her life. But I couldn't find any records of who she married and when that marriage may have happened. She also may have just taken that name to distance herself from her previous name. Then the 1950 census lists her living in San Joaquin County, California with her sister Ruth and some other extended family members. Now remember, many migrants move from Oklahoma to the San Joaquin Valley after suffering from the Dust Bowl, and therefore Mary's extended family was no exception. Uh, then on November 24th, 1961, an article appeared in the Modesto Bee from Modesto, California, quote, a coin collection valued at $98 and $65 worth of clothing were reported taken from the car of Mary M. Griffin of Stockton yesterday while it was parked in front of 1122 6th Street, Modesto, end quote. And these details seem to match up with what we know about Mary, um, you know, her new name, that she was living in California. And if this is the same Mary, she had quite an impressive coin collection. Yeah, uh, sounds like it. Yeah, just a, just a, a fun little uh, hobby that she had, which I don't know any people who collect coins. I bet they were really cool because back then, yeah. you know, currency was so different than it is now. It wasn't quite as, as standardized. So that's pretty cool. And then the last thing we know about Mary is her death on March 27th, 1965 in France. French camp, uh, which is a suburb of Stockton, uh, San Joaquin County, California, and she is buried at the Stockton Rural Cemetery, and her gravestone reads Mary M. Griffin. So that is the story of uh, Mary Turner Handsome. I um, love the part about the coins. It's mm-hmm. I love it when you get like kind of glimpses at the personality of inmates totally. that you might, the Bertillians may leave out, right. so to speak. Totally. But uh, but that is her story. And, and uh, I think actually the end of, of a, a pretty good episode, like we had some good stories and um, you know, even though Mary's crime led to a death of someone, which of course is always unfortunate and, and never, yeah. never anything we want. She had a lot of people on her side. She seemed, you know, to be for the most part, a, a law abiding, a law abiding citizen. She got, you know, arrested for being drunk a few times, but you know, who among us? <laughs> haven't no just kidding yeah. <laughs> i haven't i don't think you have um but you know I, that one is as i think perhaps more possible uh, more uh, understandable than more serious crimes so sam thanks so much for being here great job sky that was an awesome episode it was really interesting to learn about the dust bowl and mary's mm-hmm. story and how that impacted her yeah and how it impacted the whole country so sam do your own time uh, do your own number see you later see you later If you enjoyed Behind Gray Walls, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. Not only do we get to hear your feedback about the show, but it helps others find us as well. If you're interested in finding out more about the podcast and to see mugshots of the inmates featured in today's episode, follow our Facebook group at Behind Gray Walls Podcast. And we have a podcast Instagram as well. You can find us on Instagram at Behind Gray Walls Pod. Yet I would not have you think for a single minute that there is permanent disaster in these drought regions, or that the picture I saw meant depopulating these areas. No cracked earth, no blistering sun, no burning wind, no grasshoppers are a permanent match for the indomitable American farmers and stockmen and their wives and children who have carried on through desperate days and inspire us with their self-reliance, their tenacity, and their courage. It was their father's task to make homes. It is their task to keep these homes. And it is our task to help them win their fight.